Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle, to your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for about a half an hour or so, I'm going to be ranting away at a couple of things that are very important to me and I think you deserve to think about. Uh, comments, questions, reactions, as always, send them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there. Or if you prefer, you can leave a comment there. Uh, as always, if you do email me, please include something in the subject line that makes it clear this is not spam. And be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm kind of slow about email. All right, with those things out of the way, let's get right to it. I always like to start with some good news. So I've got this, which I hope is good news. I'm hoping it's, I, I want it to be good news. We'll actually have to find out if it is or not, because we've been down this road way too many times before and been disapp disappointed too many times before to have a lot of hope. But like it said, um, little hope is not the same as no hope. So let's celebrate what hope we have. Uh, the ground in the Middle East appears to be shifting, at least slightly, in the wake of the summer war. Uh, one big thing is that last week, Musa Abu Marzouk, who is the second ranking official in Hamas, uh, said that Hamas is willing to talk directly to Israel. Uh, previously, Hamas had rejected that idea unless Israel, uh, as, uh, unless Israel before that, uh, unless Israel first lifted entirely the embargo on Gaza and opened up all the border crossings. And even then, there was no guarantee it would happen. But now Marzouk says that, quoting him, just as you negotiate with weapons, you can negotiate by talking. Up until now, our policy was no negotiation with Israel, but others should be aware that this issue is not taboo. Okay, at this point, you need a little context. Back in 2007, in the wake of elections in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, the two big Palestinian parties, Hamas and Fatah, worked out a coalition government after some months of rather painful negotiations. The U.S. and Israel refused to recognize or even deal with that government, uh, with the result that that unity government ultimately broke down and a civil war broke out among the Palestinians. The um, end result of that war was that Fatah, in the form of the Palestinian Authority, retained control in the West Bank, and Hamas uh, took the lead in Gaza. All right, in April, April of this year, uh, those two reached a new unity agreement, and a new Palestinian government composed of, you know, technocrats uh, took office on June 2nd. Now, the thing is, wasn't it just two weeks ago that I said that a coalition government, that Hamas being part of a coalition government, would by the nature of political reality force Hamas to at least moderate some of its demands. I think we're seeing exactly that happening here. Even so, there was a quick reaction uh, from the Hamas press office, which said that direct talks with the Zionist enemy are not even under consideration. Now, that could be seen as in line with uh, reports from various media that have contacts inside Hamas that the leadership of the party is actually divided on the issue of direct talks with Israel. But even that, however, is a shift. And more importantly, uh, although it turns out this apparently is not the first time this idea has come up within Hamas, uh, it is the first time it's been broached publicly. So even if you want to say that this is not any part of official Hamas policy, you still then kind of have to regard it as a, as like as a trial balloon, as just like throwing an idea out there just to see what the reaction will be. Which means that right now, the important issue is how Israel reacts. Pri uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu broke off talks with the Palestinian Authority after the reconciliation deal was made this past spring, saying he would not return to the negotiating table until the Palestinian Authority president, Mamou Abbas, broke off all ties with Hamas. And Israel does have an unfortunate history of responding to any signs of moderation among Palestinian radicals with some provocative action. 
such as, for example, uh, marking the end of the summer war by engaging in the biggest ever illegal seizure of Palestinian land on the West Bank. All right, so the question now is, which path will Israel take? Now, Israel could say something, you know, in very, you know, diplomat ease, obviously, but could say something like, well, you know, if Hamas is serious about that idea of direct talks, we could, we could consider the idea. The thing is, you have to remember, you think that's how the first significant peace agreement between Israel and an Arab state, Egypt in this case, came about by exactly that kind of drop a hint and somebody take it, taking advantage of the opening. Anwar Sadat said in a speech in Egypt that he would go anywhere, even Jerusalem, in order to talk about peace. Well, the Israeli government of Menachem Begin at that time said that, well, if, if Israel thought that Sadat was serious about this, then Israel would invite him to come. To which Sadat said, in effect, thanks for the invitation, when should I be there? The ultimate result of this, like taking advantage of hints and openings, was the Camp David Peace Accords of 1978. Unfortunately, however, Israel's history of the past few decades points in a rather different direction. It points to rejecting the possibility. It points to Israel grabbing rather onto the reference from the Hamas press authority about the Zionist enemy to dismiss Marzouk's statement out of hand, uh, except perhaps as representing an attempt to distract the world from Hamas's terrorism. In other words, it points to Israel slamming the door shut rather than just seeing if it will open further. In fact, Israel has said it will not directly talk to Hamas until the group recognizes Israel's right to exist and renounces violence, which to me actually seems like laying down conditions and the full knowledge that they would never be accepted. Because what has Hamas got to offer Israel in negotiations, fundamentally, other than recognition and security guarantees? Which means, in effect, that Israel is demanding that Hamas come to the negotiating table not as an enemy, not as an opponent, not even as a negotiating part partner, but as a supplicant. Uh, so the fact is that this means is that for Israel to take advantage of the possible opening that Marzouk's statement creates, that would be a significant change in Israeli policy. But maybe, maybe it could happen. Maybe, um, maybe there is still hope. Uh, it may be false hope, but it's sometimes said that false hope is better than no hope. So I'll take what false hope I've got. The false hope in this case arises out of the fact that APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, which is a lobbying group so pro-Israel that they should just drop the American from their name and register as an agent of a foreign government, that APAC has shifted its position about this new Palestinian unity government. In the wake of that agreement, the Strings Agreement between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, AIPAC pushed Congress to enact sanctions against the Palestinian Authority for daring to reach this agreement. But now AIPAC has signed on to a letter that's being circulated among senators, which while claiming Hamas has, has no interest in peace with Israel, nonetheless drops the demand for the sanctions that were intended to undermine this unity government. Now, this is significant because APAC generally reflects Israeli government policy. And so if it's doing it here, that would actually be hinting that Israel is softening its own position on, on talks with the other side. And that would be a good thing. Um, on the other hand, I have to tell you that the letter itself is not helpful because if your interest is in at least a measure of peace with a measure of justice rather than just advancing the interests of Israel, the letter, well, the letter ultimately is a call for uh, efforts to enable the Palestinian Authority to exercise real power in Gaza over and above Hamas. In other words, this letter is picking sides in what is still an exceedingly delicate situation between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, and it will hardly help to maintain that still tenuous unity government when you enable the most militant uh, elements of Hamas to, in effect, claim that AIPAC is now dictating Palestinian policy. 
Sometimes it seems to me that the hardest thing about ending a conflict, about finding peace, is not both sides wanting peace, but both sides wanting it at the same time. I still don't know if that condition exists between Israel and the Palestinians. I do say that there is, again, some glimmer of hope, and sometimes that's the best you can do. By the way, as a footnote to that, I should mention uh, that there are other forces pressing on both Hamas and Israel that may have something to do with these slivers of daylight that have appeared. Uh, one is the fact that Israel has been condemned by a number of nations for various human rights violations in its war on Gaza. Uh, most recently, uh, the, the group Human Rights Watch accused Israel of committing war crimes in three specific cases involving t attacks on human-run schools in Gaza, uh, while at the same time expressing skepticism about the investigations that the Israeli uh, military has opened saying, quote, Israel has a long record of failing to undertake credible investigations into alleged war crime. That position was echoed by the Israeli human rights group, B'Tselem, uh, which said in a statement that based on past experience, it isn't holding out any hope that the military investigation will be anything other than a whitewash. For its part, under pressure from international news reports, Hamas has admitted that mistakes were made during the summer war uh, in launching rocket attacks on Israel from sites that were too close to residential areas or other civilian sites. The group insists that the rocket launchers were usually placed 200, at least 200 to 300 meters, which is about 220 to 330 yards from any uh, sites such as schools or hospitals, but admitted that sometimes they were closer, sometimes they were, uh, you know, too close. And the UN has sharply criticized Hamas for two, or it might have actually been three instances where rockets were found to be stored inside schools. Now, the schools are empty. There was a summer. There were no students there. But still, those are schools. Those are civilian sites, and those rockets simply should not have been there. So both sides have actually been smarting under international criticism in the wake of the war. So maybe both feel a need to at least, you know, try to make nice for a little while. My fear is that this will simply dissolve into another missed opening because well, quite bluntly, as I've said several times before, I believe that the Israeli government does not want peace because that would hinder the goal of a greater Israel encompassing all of the West Bank. But I still can hope that I'm wrong and that by some combination of war weariness and, uh, and political boldness on one or both sides, that this will turn into a Sadat goes to Israel moment. Because like they say, hope springs eternal. Right after that, I have an update on something else. Um, I was actually originally considering this as being kind of like a lighter thing compared to that, but in a way it's not, so it's an update. Last week, I offered the good news that the population of California blue whales uh, has, due to conservation efforts, recovered to almost its uh, historic 19th century levels. The update here is the reminder that California blue whales are not the only sorts of whales out there and that various types are still being hunted for commercial profit. The two biggest whaling nations in the world are Japan and, unfortunately, sadly, Iceland. Sadly because Iceland happens to be one of my favorite little countries and uh, being, uh, be, having the chance to actually go there in person and visit the island is probably the biggest single thing on my personal bucket list. Japan annually kills over a thousand whales in the Antarctic, uh, minkies, humpbacks, and fins. Using a loophole in the 1986 International Convention banning commercial whaling, that uh, loophole allows for the taking of whales for scientific research. Japan simply declares that it alone gets to determine uh, what is valid scientific research and the whaling permits it gives, um, even though such research consists essentially of just counting the numbers and types of fish in the whale's stomach and then saying, hey, now we've got all this whale meat lying around, no point in just throwing it away, and what a coincidence, whale meat is a viable commercial product in Japan, let's sell it there. 
Um, after years of protests, that argument that Japan was engaged in scientific whaling was shot down. It came crashing down in March. When in response to a suit by Australia, the International Court of Justice ruled that Japan's scientific whaling is not scientific. Now, Australia and New Zealand are taking the lead at the current meeting of the International Whaling Commission to press that body into incorporating the court's judgment into its actual policies and practices. New Zealand, in fact, has put forth a resolution that would restrict the ability of any government which is a member of the commission to issue permits for scientific, so-called scientific whaling, unless those permits are first subject to review by the International Whaling Commission itself. Japan says in response that it will establish a highly transparent quote unquote process of scientific review as it goes back to whaling in the what is the summer of 2015-2016, which for those of us in the northern hemisphere is the winter of 2015-2016. Um, but it opposes any whaling commission review of those permits. In other words, uh, Japan promises a highly transparent process which will allow it to pretty much do what it's already doing. In fact, a lobbyist for Japan at the conference told the Australian paper, the Sydney Morning Herald, that, that the New Zealand resolution will probably pass and Japan will simply ignore it. Meanwhile, Iceland has openly renewed commercial whaling. Uh, it's received now a sharply worded complaint from the European Union, the United States, and other nations, including Brazil, Mexico, and Australia, about this. Now, like Japan, Iceland claims its killing of whales has a scientific basis. Unlike Japan, it doesn't pretend that it's science rather than making money, which is the actual goal. But again, like Japan, Iceland says it simply will ignore the protest. But the thing is, a diplomatic note uh, that Iceland was given does not threaten government sanctions against Iceland, but does note that, quoting, public opinion in the countries that are Iceland's main trading partners is very much against the practice of whaling. Uh, and it also notes that because of that, if Iceland doesn't stop whaling, international boycotts of Icelandic products could well damage that country's economy. Yeah, from their mouths to your ears to your wallet. We're taking a break. And we're back. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk some about, uh, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details of um, our Nobel Peace Prize president's latest celebration of the benefits of bombing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details of what's going on. Um, but I'm going to make some observations about the whole thing. The first and most important of which is that we are being stampeded into another war. Or more exactly, we are being stampeded into re -ex expanding a war that never actually ended. Bombing in Iraq, bombing in Syria now. 1,500 so-called advisors on the ground in Iraq amid cries from jackasses like BFF, uh, Lindsey Graham, and um, John McCain, along with Buck McKeon, who's the chair of the, uh, the House Armed Services Committee, all of them talking about go all in now, troops on the ground, get in there, because apparently they just can't wait to see the spurting blood amid the shrieks of the wounded writhing in pain, because why should ISIS have all the fun? We're being stampeded by the hawks, stampeded by the ideologues, stampeded by the media, stampeded with cries of 9-11 and the gates of hell, stampeded into, as we keep on doing, creating even more extremism by seeing threats against the U.S., against us, that don't actually exist. As neither the FBI, nor Homeland Security, nor the Pentagon, nor the National Counterterrorism Center, none of which have a reputation for downplaying threats to the fatherland, none of them say that ISIS is a threat to the United States. A stampede turning into a crashing wave of equal parts ideology, paranoia, and bloodlust. And the amazing Mr. O on his surfboard just rides through the tube, the wave breaking over his head as he uses that wave to take him wherever it is he just damn well feels like going, step by step, deeper into the big muddy. 
Make no mistake. We are being set up for years of this. Years of bombing and death and fear-mongering that will extend far beyond Obama's term, far beyond his presidency, leaving his, pre his successor, whoever that is, to deal with a volatile and incomplete war against an enemy, terrorism, that, unlike a group of terrorists, can never be defeated because you can't defeat a tactic. While the visions from, 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 the, from the book 1984 about uh, faraway wars in distant places that you vaguely hear about become our daily reality. Obama came into office dealing with Bush's Iraq war. His successor will come into office dealing with Obama's Iraq and Syria war. Now, some in Congress, bless their little day late dollar short hearts, are mumbling questions about just what is Obama's authority to carry out these attacks, even as most people in that august body seem more concerned with campaigning than with doing their jobs and are going to dump the whole matter off until after the election during the, during the lame duck session, assuming they'll get to it even then. But you know the thing that really gets me about that, the thing that really gets me about that part of it? More than four years ago, I was asking, where is the authority? In that case, it actually arose in the case of Anwar al-Awlaki, the American citizen who was killed by a drone strike without any hint of due process. And I would say, where is your authority to, car to carry out this strike? Where is your authority to kill an American citizen without any due process? What gives you the right? Mr. President, I said at the time, just who the hell do you think you are? Three years ago, in the case of Libya, where was the authority? I was saying, where is the, author where is the authority for Obama to simply ignore the War Powers Resolution? Where was his authority? In fact, at the time, I said, I had been calling him PHC, President Hopi Changey. I said, I'm going to change that to GHC, Generalissimo Hopi Changey, because I said three years ago that apparently Obama has decided that the U.S. military is his to use in any way he sees fit, any time he thinks appropriate, any world in the, any, where in the world that he in his own personal, not to be questioned judgment, thinks is, thinks is deserved. And they were upfront about this. They're upfront about this. At the time, Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton told members of Congress that, that uh, the White House would simply ignore any efforts by Congress to invoke the War Powers Resolution. And now the questions are beginning to be raised, oh so tentatively, oh so gently, oh so don't rock the boatly. These questions should have been raised four years ago, at least four years ago, if not more. It is so incredibly frustrating, incredibly frustrating to be expected to deal with these things always after the fact. After four years, more, of standing by, of watching the bombings, the drone strike, the assassinations, after four years, more, of letting all this slide because you didn't want to make a fuss, to now be saying, golly, gee whiz, you know, kind of, uh, excuse me, Mr. President, do you have any authority? There is an old line about barn doors and horses that applies here. You know, but to be fair, to be fair, Obama has claimed a basis for his supposed legal authority to not only bomb Iraq, but to expand that campaign, campaign into Syria. A legal basis that, of course, does not require any congressional approval. He has the power. And he knew it because, gosh darn it, he asked top lawyers at the Office of Legal Counsel about the matter. And what do you know, uh, shock of shocks, they told him exactly what he wanted to hear. And what's that legal authority? What's the congressional authorization he claims he already has? Why, it's the AUMF, the Authorization to Use Military Force, the law that was passed in 2001 in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, the same legislation that over a year ago Obama called outdated. The guts of that act is the statement, quoting in full, 
The president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he deserves, uh, determines, planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons. Okay, how does ISIS fit that description? It doesn't. ISIS was founded in Jordan in 1999 under the name Group of Monotheism and Jihad. After the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, it became involved in the resistance to the U.S. occupation. In 2004, to build its prestige as compared to other groups in the area, it declared itself faithful to al-Qaeda and became commonly known as al-Qaeda in Iraq, even though that was never the group's actual name. It later broke off from al-Qaeda on the grounds that it claimed, in essence, it sort of said that they thought al-Qaeda had gone soft. Um, it's now a rival of al-Qaeda. In fact, al-Qaeda has denounced ISIS for the extremity of its violence. So to sum it up, ISIS was not involved in 9-11. It didn't harbor anybody from 9-11. It was not active in Iraq until after our invasion, had no connection to al-Qaeda until 2004, and it's now a bitter rival of al-Qaeda. So I ask again, how does ISIS fit the definition of those covered by the AUMF? And I answer again, it doesn't. Obama's claim is crap. So where's the actual authority for him to attack ISIS? There isn't any. And Obama knows it. He, he has to know it. Of course he knows it. He's not stupid. He knows this. The thing is, he just doesn't care. Because as long as he can make some claim, no matter how far-fetched, he can make some claim that he has this authority, he knows enough people in Congress will fold up like a beat-up accordion. The thing is, you've got to realize, again, you've got to realize here, this is important. This has nothing to do with whether or not you think ISIS is a threat to the U.S., even though it's not. It has nothing to do with whether or not you think bombing is, uh, ISIS is, is um, a good idea or not, or the right thing to do or not. It has nothing to do with whether or not you want to see boots on the ground, or should I say more boots on the ground. It has to do with the legal, the constitutional authority to commit the United States to year after year of death and destruction and war. That is a power no one person should ever have, but it is a power that Obama is claiming for himself and one that members of Congress, or at least a good number of them, are prepared to passively let him take. It is disgraceful, it is dangerous, it is frightening. The other day someone asked me, as a, as a, whether I, asked me what I, as a believer in nonviolence, to do about ISIS. Now, I'm not going to get into a discussion about nonviolence here. It's not important. The, what's relevant here is that I said is that the first thing is that I wouldn't be in this situation because I wouldn't have done the things that got us into it. And maybe, just maybe, just possibly, if people had started asking where's the authority four or more years ago, maybe you wouldn't, we wouldn't be in this situation now. All right, so that's it. That's it for this week. I'm going to have to wrap up there. I'm just about out of time. Um, I will tell uh, those of you that, uh, in case you noticed, um, that uh, the Outrage of the Week and the Clown Award will both return next week. Uh, but I had this stuff I wanted to talk about right now. So uh, I'm going to leave it there. And I'm just going to say to the rest of you and everybody out there, everybody watching, um, you have the best week you possibly can. Peace.